There seems to be a fair amount of snickering about the subject of Britain and their negative 1.3 tolerance policy, which is the lowest tolerance the country has had in 75 years. Concerning any blade purchased or crafted for any purpose other than the carving of the most delicate of turkey or finch roasts, but one must consider the fact that their Supreme Court's members still use the powdered wigs, one must not downplay the theatrical origin of their judicial system. But mu musket deaths have plummeted the past century and a half. Still, they are dumbfounded by the surge of the new blade that thrusts out, once released by a pumpkin-shaped button on the handle, even which craft is dependent on the fools who boast of their dark spells and the jeweled symbols they wear. But these blades are another story. One cannot identify the carrier and concealer until the sound of Martha Umbridge's tumbling oranges. You may remember the amendment of the Jack of Spades in 1889. The character was originally portrayed wielding a featherless arrow retrieved from his cloak and about to be pricked into the monocle to clock tower master Henry Fonsworth. Who would be caricatured in the tarot card, the slumbering caretaker? Who had not seen the arrow due to its being painted in the same peppermint pattern of the jack's cloak from which it was drawn? A controversy about the card was aroused after Jack the Ripper began leaving his mark inside the hats of his victims. The Jack of Spades. Well... Parliament ruled in favor of the Butterlands Committee and their widely reprinted article entitled Taking the Higher Road, Slippery Slopes and How to Gain Ground, Not Directly Affected by Them. And there was not an open mouth in the court, except for veteran town spectator Albert Crumsby, who was smacking some custard he had been spooning in anticipation. A whirlwind of ribboned hats and cheers as the crowd spilled out into the town, sharing the news, and so Jack's arrow was replaced. This time, his cavernous no nostrils and sloping eye sockets illuminated by one candelabra, which we associate with the revealing of the unknown, as well as practicality. It was but twenty years later when the Cranwich family's barn and all twelve of its horses burned to the ground. Where else? Well, Parliament once again agreed with the Butterlands Committee, whose one member, Reginald Amberson, at one point stood and shouted, And I don't think I shall mention the smell, not quite putrid, but awful all the same. The twelve times four of them horses' hooves is all they could salvage it was. I don't even know what number that is, but it's quite too many for this town. And you can hear a pin drop but not from the lap of Brenda Fallenshire, who was an expert knitter and had been knitting in anticipation. Then a thunder of dusty penny loafers on the cobblestone corner of Fifth and whatever it was Avenue, where stood Wilkshire's candle factory. Then at the command of Arthur Crumminsby, the mob pressed on the mouth of the titanic gate with two timbers. Collapse the gate, they cried, gaining entry and dispersing the fires that would bring the candle factory to the ground. Where else? and in their perpetual sorrow. Hoorah, yip-pip, they cried, and now standing proud of themselves and crossed-armed and smoking cigarettes, they chuckled and cursed the confused candle factory workers who fled from the building shortly before it collapsed. And so the Jack of Spades card was amended, this time to carry the tail end of a hanging rope, which nobody dared to challenge. Not yet, anyway.